In the past videos, we've been talking about constructing a confidence interval for a population mean. Now, we solved these problems assuming that we knew sigma, or the population standard deviation. Now, if we knew the population standard deviation, that would mean that we would know all the numbers in the population. And if we knew all the population numbers, or the data, then why the heck would we be estimating using a confidence interval? So, the use of sigma in a confidence interval is just to kind of help you with the formulas and the overall process. But the truth of the matter is, you're never going to know the population sigma if you're estimating the mean. So, chapter 10.3 is estimating a population mean with sigma unknown. Now, if we don't know sigma, um, we can't really use a normal distribution. So, if, if you read along, it says, in this section we'll perform procedures on the mean without knowing the population standard deviation. However, to do so means we will need to learn a new type of distribution. Since we don't know the population standard deviation, we can no longer rely on normal distributions for our calculations. Thankfully, William Seeley Gossett solved that problem for us. Now, if you would like some more information on this gentleman, uh, feel free to Google him, and you will find out some cool stuff. Now, since we don't know sigma, we estimate it by using the sample standard deviation, S, which we talked about before. When the standard deviation of a statistic is estimated from the data, the result is called the standard error. And that should look slightly familiar. All right? It's the standard deviation of the statistic. So, standard error, we use this formula, S over the square root of n. Now, it's almost identical to sigma over the square root of n, but of course we don't know sigma, but it's the same idea. Okay, so the t distribution. Unfortunately, this is where we part ways momentarily with the z table, which of course pains me very much. So when sigma is known, we base a confidence interval on mu, or for mu, on the sample distribution for x bar, which is normal. Okay. And a uh, friendly reminder here that you should have a printout of these notes, and you're just kind of filling in the blanks. When sigma is not known, we substitute sigma over the, or s over the square root of n, and the resulting statistic is not normal. It is called a t distribution, not a normal distribution. Okay. Unlike the normal distribution, there is a different t distribution for each sample size. So there's not one almighty graph or table that we use, or, or rather distribution. There is an almighty table that we use. We specify a particular t distribution, and this is new, by giving its degrees of freedom, which is a new vocabulary term. It's very easy. It's n minus 1. You take the sample size, you subtract 1. OK. Now, here's a graph of the t distribution. Good news is it's still bell-shaped, roughly symmetric. Now, if you look at the solid line, okay, this is the standard normal Z uh, distribution. And you can see it's the dotted line is a T of only 2 degrees of freedom, and then this, uh, the next solid line is a little lighter, is 9 degrees of freedom. So as N increases, the graph gets approximately more normal. Shocker, I know. So here's some facts about the t-distribution. You can read those. Basically, it's symmetric, single-peaked. Uh, it has more variation than a normal distribution. As n increases, the graph gets closer to a normal. And um, s estimates sigma, all right, more accurately as the sample size increases. OK, so let's practice using that t-table. Okay, so in the back of your book, the very last page of your textbook, it's actually the back back, there is a T table, or a T distribution, and it looks like this. Now, it's a new table that you will get on every test or quiz, and you will get it, of course, on your... AP exam, excuse me. Now, uh, there's really two things you need to know. You see a list of degrees of freedom. Here on the left 
In the middle, you got a bunch of T stars, and if you scan all the way down to the bottom, you have all the confidence intervals, the confidence levels, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 95, 96, 98, 99, 99.5, 99.8, 99.9. So it's actually pretty easy to read. You get the confidence level, you get the degrees of freedom, you just kind of scan over and you'll get your T star. So let's do let's practice a little bit with that. Let's say locate the T star, all right, critical value, for a 95% confidence interval based on n equals 12 observations. And again, you're following along on your note sheet. So in this case, the degrees of freedom is 12 minus 1, which is 11. And I want 95% confidence. So I go to my table, and I am at 95% confidence. So I'm in this column, and my degrees of freedom were 11. So I go over here, I find 11, all right, 95%, 11 degrees of freedom. I scan over, and I get 2.201. So that is my T star. <clears throat> Pretty easy. 2.201 T star equals. All right, let's say I want a 90% confidence interval from a simple random sample of 25 observations. So again, degrees of freedom, n minus 1, 25 minus 1, obviously is 24. And I go to my table. I want 90% confidence at 24. So I'm going to go 90% confidence. So I'm in this column. 24 degrees of freedom. I scan over and I get 1.711. 1.711. So that would be my T star. 1.711. And the last one. And it does get a little tricky here. 80% confidence. That's new. Sample size 55. 55 minus 1 is 54. So there are 54 degrees of freedom. Now, when I go to my table, I got a problem because 54 is not on the table right here. Boom. Okay. So I wanted 80%, but 54 degrees of freedom. Now, I'm going to have to round, and I'm not going to round like I normally would round. I'm always going to round down because if I go with 60, I'm assuming that I have more people than I actually have. So I, I, I'm kind of, I'm not playing it safe. So I want to play it safe, and the safe bet is to say, well, I have 54, so I did have 50, okay? I didn't quite have 60, so I can't use it. So 80% confidence, I'm going to round that down to 50 and get 1.299. T star equals 1.299. So, little note, always round down. Okay, now, uh, we talk about a formula. So, a one-sample T interval. Now, so if you're asked to make a confidence interval, all right, for a sample mean in which you don't know sigma, you're going to use this formula. X bar, plus or minus, X bar is your statistic, plus or minus T star times S over the square root of N. And this interval is exactly correct when the population distribution is normal and is approximately correct for large n in other cases. So again, we've got a pretty basic formula. We've got our statistic, plus or minus our critical value, times the standard deviation of the statistic. And we're substituting s because we don't know the population. We get that from the sample. Okay, let's do an example. So take a second to read the question. All right. I've already put those numbers in my calculator. You may want to pause it and put those numbers in your calculator, or you can just follow along. So we're talking about the uh, nitrous oxide emission all right, from some vehicles, auto exhaust. And we want to construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the mean amount of NOx emitted by light duty engines. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to type these numbers in my uh, calculator. Now, again, I don't know anything about the population. This is, came from my sample. All right. I don't know anything about the population. So I type those numbers in my calculator, and I'm going to run some one variable stats. <clears throat> now, I type my numbers in list 2 because I had some more important information in list 1, and I get what I need. I'm concerned with x bar, s sub x, which is my standard deviation, and n. Okay, so I'm going to write those down, so I don't have to keep going back to my calculator. And that was x bar, 
equals 1.33, S equals 0.4844, and N equals 46. Okay. So, now we are going to construct and interpret. So, the first thing I want to do is identify the population. The population is all light duty engines. All right, that's what I'm getting information around about is uh, auto exhaust from gas engines. Okay, the parameter of interest in this case, all right, what am I getting information about? What am I estimating right here? The mean amount of NOx emitted. Again, the true mean amount, which I don't know because I have to go find every single engine and figure out the NOx emitted. All right. Now, everyone's least favorite part, the conditions, which you must check every single time. Now, I want you to see this. I want to see them listed. I want you to write SRS and then to talk about whether it's <coughs> met or not. Uh, so we scan up the following sample. Ah, there it is, random sample. So this is stated in the problem. Stated in problem. Okay, two, normal, central limit theorem to the rescue, n greater than or equal to 30, all right, there are 46 in my sample, so again, I'm not concerned with the population size, central limit theorem says that the sampling distribution will be approximately normal, so CLT applies, that makes life very easy, we'll get into examples where the central limit theorem does not apply. And the last condition is independence. And of course, that's the population greater than or equal to 10n. And I multiply the sample by 10, I get 460. And I'm going to assume that there's more than 460 light duty engines in the population. Okay, now for the fun part, calculations. First thing I got to do is identify what type of interval I am constructing. So, it is a one sample T interval. Okay, and then I write my formula, X bar plus or minus uh, T star S over the square root of N. And, of course, I'm creating a 95% confidence interval. Okay, so, off to the side here, I'm going to list a few things. X bar, 1.33. S was 0.4844. N is 46. Now, that makes my degrees of freedom, 46 minus 1, which is 45. Now, a T star, 4.95. So, I'm going to go to my chart, and I'm going to look up degrees of freedom, 45, 95%. So, here we are at 95%, 45 degrees of freedom. Again, I can't use 50, because I don't have 50, but I can use 40, because I got 40. And I get 2.021. All right. 2.021. Okay, now I'm going to pause the video real quick and do the calculations. And then you uh, check. Well, I'll plug them in first so you can see it. 1.33 plus or minus 2.021 times 0.4844 over the square root of 46. Okay, so I kind of finished the problem out. I'm running out of time. You can check each step. All right, I do the standard deviation first, then I multiply, subtract, and add. 
And then, of course, you have your conclusion or your interpretation. We are 95% confident that the true mean amount of NOx emitted is between 1.186 and 1.474 grams per mile. And, of course, I did add units to that.